सुखदम मरण करुण मिलन मधुर स्मरण करुण कालवशादेह सकलम करुण समय दिपते अखिल करुण गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन Sadhguru, it's a great opportunity and honor for me to interact with you. In many ways, there can't be a greater contrast between two <laughs> individuals. At you, least in appearance, we are. You from a very urban and very sophisticated background. I grew up in a village in Telugu medium, and you are in the spiritual realm. And I'm anything but spiritual. I'm in the completely temporal realm. I built all my life around the principles of rationality and logic. In some ways, this is a collision of frame of the two frames of reference, and I greatly look forward to learning a great deal from you, and getting a lot of insights as to how to manage the synthesis. In some ways, you are the thesis and the antithesis. <laughs> so, hopefully, a synthesis will emerge today, Sadhguru. Sadhguru, with your permission, I would like to broadly uh, explore three or four themes. The first is about what is right and what is wrong, and uh, what is good and what is bad, and what is morality, what are taboos, and what is the role of values and the role of institutions. That's one broad subset of themes. The second is, as the blurb said, politics and corruption. You cannot escape those two things, unfortunately, in India today. Therefore, politics and corruption, without going into party politics, but the broader issue of politics. The third is our nation and our society, and the fourth is this collision of spiritual and the temporal worlds. Oh, you better be ready for a whole night then. <laughs> uh, if I may start off with the first um, line of inquiry. So when you were a person of religion, you were, you were given certain edicts, what is good, what is bad, the Ten Commandments, the do's and the don'ts. But in ordinary life, for most people, particularly in the public domain, to distinguish between good and bad seems to be increasingly difficult. I've always held that there are two realms, the individual, individual gain, and the second is the public good. If one is clashing with the other, if my personal gain is clashing with the public good, then that is something bad. If both are in harmony, then that is something good. That seems to me to be a workable definition of what is good and bad for ordinary interaction between the citizen or indiv individual and the community and the society. What are your thoughts on that? See, so once you start a, a debate as to what is good and what is bad, actually in reality, this debate can go on forever without coming to a conclusion. Obviously, you have debated this within yourself and around yourself for many years and still there's no conclusion. And believe me, people have been debating this for thousands of years and still there is no conclusion. Why this is so is, generally this starts from within the family, that is uh, people who have the authority within the family. If you really carefully look at it, essentially it boils down to this, what I do is good, what you do is bad. <laughs> that extends to the society, to politics, to various things. Whoever is in a position of power, who is in a position of dominance, they may not spell it out so crudely, but in so many ways they're telling you, what I do is right, what you do is wrong. So ultimately it becomes about whoever is in a state of advantage is right, 
whoever is in a state of disadvantage is wrong. Well, that principle is the basis of all exploitation and all the ugliness that you see on the planet. So instead of starting a debate on what is good and what is bad, I think what we need is what is appropriate and what is inappropriate to our times, to our society, to our existence here, to our level of economics, what is right and what is appropriate and what is inappropriate. Now, if… Uh, I'm just saying for example, we are a rich nation because if you have twenty-nine rupees per day, you are rich in this country. We are one rich nation, another rich nation is United States. So between these two, if you compare, what may be right there is not right here because the conditions are not same, people's lives are not same, culture is not same, people's emotions are not same, people's wants, likes and dislikes are not same. So what is right there may be completely wrong here. What is right here may be completely wrong there. So within the nation, when we say a nation, we believe we are all Indians, but here everybody has an opinion of his own. It will be fanciful to think there is one person here who doesn't have an opinion of his own who goes by Indian constitution. There is not one single person like that here. Everybody has their own opinion, their own twist of what is right and wrong, isn't it? 1.2 billion people, every one of them <laughs> has their own opinions. Two people cannot agree as to what's right and wrong. So instead of looking at right and wrong, if we start looking at what is appropriate, okay, these are our conditions, this is our life, what is the most appropriate thing to do right now? Tomorrow if our conditions change, the appropriateness changes, then there will be no clashes. Constantly the clash between the previous generation and this generation between one human being and the other human being is your ideas of right and his ideas of right are so different. Parents and children are fighting, administration and people are fighting, management and union is fighting simply because your ideas of good and bad are very different and it's always different. Within the family, between the husband and the wife, basic unit of the family, their ideas of right and wrong are very different. So once you enter that space, you are entering into an endless controversy, no possibility of a solution. But if you look at appropriateness of action, then we can arrive at what is the appropriate thing to do in our society, for our conditions, for our limitations. Now, Sadhguru, I hear you saying that A, the cultural ambience in which you live, that matters about the appropriateness and B, it changes from time to time, generation yes. to generation. In other words, people sometimes confuse taboos with morals, the changing fashions and attitudes with morals. But unless we have some kind of a yardstick which is measurable and somewhat universal in guiding our behavior and dealing with the society at large or perhaps even in nature, how are we going to give people a yardstick other than religious edicts? That is a challenge for many agnosts because we can't go by the Ten Commandments merely because God gave us those. We can't go by the Gita because Lord Vishnu told us so. We need a, a temporal yardstick. We need an institutional mechanism to be able to measure and say this is right, this is wrong, a talisman. We need to understand this. Right now, we are trying to fix human life with morality. It's never worked. Even the Ten Commandments that you are referring to repeatedly has never worked. It's only carved in the stone. Nobody has ever really stuck to it, believe me. <laughs> People who said, thou shall not kill are the ones who are killing constantly. It is just that it will happen in a different garb, in a different way. So if trying to fix the human societies with morality, will only bring more and more deception. And above all, it kills life in so many different ways. Why are we trying to fix life with morality? Essentially because we have never bothered to stir up humanity. There is something called as humanity within us. If you stir up this dimension which we call as humanity, 
when somebody is feeling very human, he doesn't need morality, he will be fine the way he is. But instead of being a human being, he becomes a Christian or a Hindu or a Muslim or an Indian or a Pakistani or this or that or so many things, caste, creed and many, many things. So instead of a human identity, he takes on a different identity. Now you can do most horrible things with great pride. Yes, you can kill thousands, not one. You can kill thousands and feel really good about it. I did it because I did it for the nation, I did it for my religion, I did it for my caste, creed, whatever else. So your identity is shifting from your fundamental identity to make-believe identities. It may serve limited purpose. We are a nation because we have to politically manage ourselves. It is not some uh, divine dictum that this is a nation like this. We are the people who draw, drew the lines, isn't it? Now we believe that's how it is. For certain functional realities we draw lines, but that is not the reality. So a human being should essentially be identified as a human being, not by his religion, not by his race, not by his caste, creed, nationality, no. If he sits here as a human being, you don't… you will see he does not need morality, he will be fine. And that's what is needed in the society, to stir up humanity, not morality. That's it. That, that's a terrific message, um, Sadhguru. Essentially what you're advocating is that go beyond the individual, go beyond the sect and the creed and embrace humanity itself. And you will not go wrong in your actions. Uh, I'm yes. not saying embrace humanity. I'm saying you are human, isn't it? I don't have to teach you to be human, you are human. The problem is somebody else has taught you that you are something else. Somebody else has told you you are Indian, somebody else has told you you are Hindu, somebody else has told you you are Muslim. But the reality is you are human. If you go little further, you are just a piece of life, isn't it? If you sit here as a piece of life, do you have any problem with any piece of life in the existence? If you sit here and throb as a piece of life, which is what's happening, it doesn't matter, we are talking something, whatever we may be talking, essentially we are sitting here as throbbing as a piece of life. Rest is all made up by us, isn't it? This is the reality of existence. If you sit here as a piece of life, you instantly know that there is nothing in the existence with which you are not connected. But if you sit here as an Indian, if the person sitting next to you is P, there's problem. If you sit here as a Hindu, if the next person is M, problem. Like this it goes on, it doesn't stop there. It goes into further and further divisions and divisions and divisions. So, essential dimension of spiritual process is that you disidentify yourself with all the false identities you have taken on and to learn to sit here just as a piece of life. If you sit here as a piece of life and throb as a piece of life, breathe as a piece of life. You know this happened a few years ago because you mentioned this project Green Hands, I'm bringing this on. When I said that we need to plant 114 million trees to get Tamil Nadu to 33 percent green cover, People said, Sadhguru, do you know what is 114 million? Is it possible for any human being to plant this many? See, I told them, the population of Tamil Nadu is 62 million people. If all of us plant one tree, take care of it for two years and plant for one more tree, what is the number? You got it. So it's not difficult, even a beggar is capable of planting one tree, isn't it? Now the problem is that they must feel for it. How do you do it? I told them, you don't worry. I went out village to village, called farmers associations together. I told them one simple thing, just sit here. Where do you want to sit? In the sun or under the tree? Choose. You know what's the choice. Everybody sits under the tree. Now I said, see, you are you breathing? Yes. I want you to understand what you exhale, the tree is inhaling. What the tree is exhaling, you are inhaling. Just sit here and feel it, it's happening. 
one half of your lungs is hanging out there. Your breathing equipment is not completely here, only one half is here, one half is hanging out there. Just see the tree and breathe, it just caught like a fire. We've not planted 114 million trees, but 17 million trees. And <laughs> Tamil Nadu's green cover has officially gone up by 7.2 percent. And we didn't give up our lives to do this, this is just one of the small things we do. This is just one aspect of our activity, we didn't give up our life to do this. Just that, if everybody gets involved, it's such a small job, isn't it? Why are they not getting involved? Because they're identified with something. If they sat here as a piece of life, nobody had to tell them. They would have anyway done it by themselves. So, it is because of these wrong identifications that we are doing all these crazy things and you're trying to fix it with morality, it's not going to work. It's not worked for these thousands of years, isn't it? So the best thing is, first step is to stir up your humanity. If that is done, the next thing is to see that you're just a piece of life. Even, even being human is your idea. Well, the theory of evolution was… is telling you, just some time ago you were a monkey. I'm sorry, not me, Charles Darwin. <laughs> Just some time ago you were a monkey and the difference between you and a chimpanzee, your DNA is only 1.23 percent different from that of a, a chimpanzee. Not a big difference, isn't it? After all, they're your relatives still. Many of your relatives look like that, isn't it, when you don't like them <laughs> So, experiencing life as life is more important than we making up something which is not true. This is what has happened to human society. This is what has happened to human psyche that they are not sitting here as life. They are sitting here as so many things which they are not. They realize this only when they die. Sadhguru, as a parochial aside, I wish Isha Foundation is in Andhra Pradesh so that we would have got the benefit of the tree plantation. I am in Andhra Pradesh things. right now. <laughs> <laughs> I hope these seeds will truly spread. Sadhguru, that brings me to the question of ensuring that the moral conduct is actually upheld while spiritual gurus, religion itself and societal norms have a value, they don't seem to be sufficient. Only in India, whenever you talk about corruption or some other misconduct in public life or in private life, we talk of morality and values instead of talking no, about uh, institutions… As far as I'm concerned, there's no corruption in India. Where is corruption in India? There is only banditry. <laughs> I don't see any corruption. Because corruption means you come to me and you want a favor to be done, I'm willing to do it, this but you know, under the table I want two rupees from you. This is corruption. Is what's happening I is break plunder. your head and I take everything that you have, this yeah. is not corruption. It's just plunder. <laughs> <laughs> so when we… when we talk of… Uh, all these evils in the public domain. Oftentimes you talk of values in this country rather than enforcing a certain code of conduct. There's something that troubles people like me because if indeed values without any external compulsion can be internalized and they can guide the behavior of every single human being, they probably guide the behavior of a large majority of people because if there is peace in this country, if all of us are going to go back home after this uh, session, with a reasonable degree of certainty that there will be not… Um, there will not be any victims of violence, it's because the society has these norms and values. But there's always deviant behavior in society. Unless the laws of the land, unless the enforcement mechanism are strong enough to enforce a certain code of conduct and prove that there is punishment for bad behavior and reward for good behavior, I'm afraid values in themselves will not for long sustain us. Not at all. Now, this is something that we need to get from you because Overemphasis on values at the cost of institutions sometimes may actually become an excuse for doing nothing to build institutions. It's a bit like this water in the glass. The water is obviously the one that is giving life. Without that, we can't quench the thirst. But without the glass, without the container, the water is not usable. While water is what gives life, the container, the institutions are what make the life, the, the, the value usable. So my appeal to you is, 
A, give us a, your, your views, and if you broadly think that this is the right approach, what institutional mechanisms we need to build, in your estimate, to build higher levels of public integrity, higher levels of civic conduct? See, one important thing that India needs to do is to simplify the laws in a way that everybody understands it. Right now it's so, so complex and so ambiguous, nobody really knows what it is. And because it's… there is so much ambiguity, it creates so much grey areas which breeds corruption endlessly. If there is no ambiguity, somebody just couldn't come and ask money out of me to do some work, isn't it? There is so much ambiguity. These laws were largely created by the English because they wanted ambiguity so that they could interpret it whichever way they want. If they want to pick you up tomorrow morning, they want to pick you up and there's a good enough reason. We have still kept the same laws and even today it is true, the law can just come and pick you or me up now and I don't know what I have done, but you can pick you up and they can produce something, number, whatever, criminal procedure code, some damn number that I am not aware of and they can say, you did this. Because it's such an ambiguous law, this is good to control foreign nations if you occupy them, not for our nation to move ahead. Too much ambiguity. I… I… to give you an example, I'm sure uh, there are people involved in various kinds of real estate is one of the big activities happening. If you want to… I don't know how long it takes in Andhra Pradesh, normally in Tamil Nadu it takes twelve to fourteen months to get an approval for a building. Many things would have changed in fourteen months' time. You may be no more interested to build in fourteen months' time. You go through some sixteen departments and you have to put people to follow this file every day, where it is going. And of course there is a fixed fee, beyond the fee. All that you do, still fourteen months. In the end, you have spent so much, you have spent so much time, with vengeance you break the law. You understand? <laughs> Just with vengeance because you… you spent so much money. If you said ten thousand square feet, I want to build fifteen thousand square feet because anyway I paid you, what is the big deal? It comes to that. So all laws are flouted without any problem. In United States we are building, you know, we are building a big center. Here if you go, they have a code book, building code. Your… your architect anyway has to be certified, he must know the codes. Apart from that, a code book is given to you about two hundred fifty pages. You better read it. You build whatever you want, no department, no sanction. You build whatever you want, but before occupation, he will come for an inspection. If it's by the code, it's fine. If it's not by the code, your building goes down and you go in. <laughs> Simple. So now the amount of government machinery that is needed just to sanction a building is cut down to just a few people rather than these various departments. If I'm a citizen of this country, why do you think I'm naturally a criminal? Why are you sanctioning what I should do, what I should not do? Just tell me this is the way to build in this country, I will build that way. If I don't, bring it down. I I'm just saying as one example. You can see million examples like this in the country where laws are unnecessarily complicated and ambiguous which is essentially breeding ground for corruption. Sadhguru, the saying in Andhra Pradesh is in Tamil Nadu, give you a bribe and your work gets done. Don't tell me. <laughs> in Andhra Pradesh, you give you a bribe and still you are harassed. So there are still grades and grades in this corruption phenomena in this country. Sadhguru, before we go into the issue of politics and uh, corruption, because all of us love to hate politicians. I, I wouldn't allow that because it's become a fashion and a fad and almost a compulsion that wherever you go, people are talking politics. How horrible the politicians are, whether they know about it or they don't know about it, from a tea shop to an office and wherever else it's happening. 
if you are a responsible citizen, what democracy means is, it is the people's government. These politicians did not land from the sky, they are one among you who stood up to do something. Now for whatever reasons they've become the way they've become, you do not know how many have become like that, how many not. We are generalizing because we have a certain pleasure in painting everything very bleak and black. If your nation is important for you and if you believe that you have handed over your nation to a bunch of crooks and you are sitting here and it's entertainment for you, I think it is you who needs to be punished, not the corrupt. Because democracy cannot be a spectator sport, it is a participatory process. If I say participatory, most people's understanding of this is if I come out once in five years and vote, my responsibility is over. No, democracy has various instruments through which you can participate on a daily basis in the governance of your country, your state, your city and your street. There are various mechanisms. Oh, I don't know. Why you don't know? Because you're not cared, isn't it? Why you have not educated yourself to know is you have not cared because the idea of the nation has not gone deep enough in this country. Still, our identifications with our religions, our caste, our creed, our family is more predominant than the ide identity of the nation. This is the reason why these things are happening. I don't know if I can share this but let me <laughs> try it out because this happened in Andhra Pradesh. I was traveling with a lady who comes from a political family in Andhra Pradesh. I saw the way things were going on in the family and stuff and I just joked, if you are given a choice, probably your father will break the country into four pieces and give it to the four children that he has. You… I was amazed and shocked, I didn't know what… I don't know how to articulate this expression. The person was actually genuinely said, what is wrong with that? Our father loves us <laughs> It's my birthright <laughs> Yes. Now, what we need to understand is we as a nation are moving from a feudalistic existence to a democratic existence. The system has changed, but our mind has not changed. We are still feudalistic. People are complaining, not everybody. A lot of people are complaining. Their complaint is only that we didn't get the chance to be corrupt. <laughs> we are at the receiving end or the giving end. They are not complaining that there is corruption. Really, I'm telling you. <laughs> I have been interacting with people on all levels and I know they are not really complaining about corruption. It is just that we have to pay and they are taking. I would like to be on the other side. If you want to test it out, tomorrow morning b b b remove all the police from Hyderabad city, just see how many people actually stop at the red light if there's no policeman. My average is ninety percent won't stop. Some fools like me will stop. I'm driving in Coimbatore or wherever, red light, I stop. Everybody is going zook, zook next to me and they're looking at me, who is this fool <laughs> who's blocking the traffic, <laughs> you know? They're looking at me, what's wrong with you? No police <laughs> So the essentially our integrity has gone down. It is not even a question of integrity, it is just that within ourselves we are still very feudalistic but we are trying to be democratic. So democracy… democracy in India is still in an evolutionary state, needs lot more evolution and nobody has done to educate people as to what is democracy. Not enough work has been done. It has not been brought into our education systems. Social organizations, the government itself should have taken it up in a big way to educate people why democracy. See, the moment we vote for our religion, or caste or creed or even family, if you ought, there is no democracy anymore. There is only feudalism, isn't it? <laughs> democracy will be a functional democracy 
only when you go and vote and you don't know who your wife voted for, who your husband voted for and you don't want to know. Only if you have this kind of integrity, democracy will work. You tell your whole family, all of you vote for this person, this is not democracy, it's finished. I'm saying that has not been understood at all. We had a set of by-elections in Andhra Pradesh recently in eighteen assembly constituencies and one Lok Sabha constituency. It is widely believed that something like four hundred to five hundred crore rupees were spent at the very least. It's not spent, it's invested <laughs> Sadhguru, you made some extremely important comments about democratic evolution, while we all have aspirations to expect that we'll suddenly become a great liberal democracy overnight without working hard at it, is somewhat unrealistic is the gist of what you're saying. And I'm grateful for those comments because that appreciation is very critical, particularly for those of us sitting here, the middle classes who are so impatient about what's happening in the country. In that context, uh, Sadhguru, somebody said, the best way of getting justice is rendering justice to your ad adversary, to your opponent. The quickest way of getting justice because he will then understand your point of view and he will then come to an agreement which is just to both of you. Oftentimes, I think, in dealing with public affairs in this country, we have forgotten that. There is this acrimony, this bitterness, not only among political parties but also between the media and the political parties, between the public and the political parties and the governments, a lot of anger, and a lot of uh, polarization. One thing I, I would like you to advise us, um, Sadhguru, if you ask a politician, look, why are you doing what you're doing? You're a good man, you're an ethical man. A, he has many alibis. He'll tell you a hundred reasons why he genuinely had to do what he did in order to survive in office. In other words, honest and good conduct is not conducive to survival in political office increasingly in the country. And B, in any country, even in the United States or Britain or Germany or Japan, there's always a clash between what the voters want in the short term and what the nation needs in the long term. And the politician has the difficult task of bridging these two. And he cannot survive without the voters' goodwill and the nation cannot survive without the politician's wisdom. How do you bridge this gap, Sadhguru? They like the question. They like the question, they may not like the answer. <laughs> First thing is, uh, I would like you and everybody else to drop the word justice from their language because there's no such thing as justice on the planet. What is justice for you? will be injustice for somebody. Usually the word justice is used to enforce revenge on someone, whether it's a legal revenge or illegal revenge. But whatever, if somebody does a killing, he thinks he's got what he deserved. Somebody thinks so, isn't it? That's why they do it. So let's not go by justice. Let us simplify the laws and enforce the law. Right now nobody has any right to think about justice. We must become a law-abiding law society first. After that, the luxury of justice will come. When sometimes when the law itself is cruel, we can break the law and deliver justice. Right now, the way we are in this country, there is no luxury like that. Here, law must be enforced first. Simply enforce the law. It may be unjust, but enforce it. Because without a semblance of order, there will be no luxury of justice in any society. Right now, we have no order. Where is the question of justice? Revenge will be labeled as justice. Now, how to bring this about in a society? As I said, one most important thing is to simplify the laws. And if you want to live in this country, everybody must understand the basic laws, what the laws are. Most of the people existing in this country do not know what the basic laws are. Every time you ask, they will throw their hands up. They think somebody should tell them. 
No, we must make it a law that if you want to live in this country, at least this many basic laws you must know. If you want to drive on the street, you must know what are the laws of the street, isn't it? Similarly, if you want to live in this country, you must know this, this and this. Not that you heard from your neighbor, not like that. Proper education, everybody knows that these are the laws. If you break it, this is the punishment, everybody should know, isn't it? And then enforce it. It's not as simple, enforcing. Making the law itself is complex, enforcement is a super complex thing because here comes justice injustice. So for a certain period of time, we must be willing to surrender justice and just stick to law. People who are enforcing law sometimes will enforce it in unjust ways. You must endure that. If you don't endure that, you will have a disorderly society, a lawless society. Then revenge will be the way, but we will call it justice. We will go about labeling it as justice, taking revenge on each other. Many things are happening. People are shooting each other and they think they're rendering justice because the law is not sensible. So, in making this happen, in creating an orderly society, not a just society, I want you to understand this because this is a serious sacrifice that we must be willing to make if we want to move ahead. This is a very serious sacrifice that I don't ask for justice, enforce the law on me, whatever the law, I'll go by it. It may not be just, but I'll go by the law right now. If the law is very unjust, we can look at restructuring in the law, but beyond the law, no justice. Nobody has the discretion to deliver justice. This has to be established. This one thing we have not done yet. See, the problem with us is, we are a… If you travel hundred kilometers in India, people look different. They dress differently, they speak differently, different languages, our food is different, everything is different. But still, for over ten thousand years, the whole world has referred to us as one nation. Though we were over two hundred political entities at some time, still, you know, we've been doing trade with Syria, Jerusalem, Damascus, Jerusalem, Greece, all these places for over eight thousand, ten thousand years. Even at those times, they referred to this country as Hindustan, though there were two hundred entities, it was referred to as one nation, as Bharatvarsh or Hindustan or whatever the name. Because somewhere people saw this as one nation, though it was ruled by many kings, because there was one ethos, which is something that the politicians and administrators and the people have never paid attention to. The only thing which keeps us as one nation is a certain fundamental spiritual ethos which is not on the surface but which is always there. In the sense, people recognize this as one nation from outside because they all believed in something. This nation has never been a nation of believers. We have been a nation of seekers because spiritual process has been the main thing. Here people are not believing in God, they are seeking mukti or liberation or freedom. There is a difference between a seeker and a believer. A believer means he's made a conclusion, a seeker means he's wide open, he's… he's realized that he does not know, that's why he's seeking. This one quality set us apart from the rest of the world, so outside world recognized as one nation, though there were so many political entities. We need to understand even today, it is only this spiritual thread which is keeping this as one nation. If you… right now it's being systematically hacked at. If you break this one thing, after twenty-five, thirty years, you will wonder, why are we one nation and we will break. If you do not strengthen the fundamental spiritual ethos of this nation, if you hack it down with beliefs and other kinds of identities, you will see you will break up into various nations, you will not be one nation. Sadhguru, I hear you clearly and I entirely agree with you that unless unity and order are kept even above liberty if necessary, if there is a clash, we are in danger. I, I totally concur with you as a true democrat and libertarian. But whether spiritualism could be the 
glue to keep the country united when there are so many meanings of spiritualism. In the name of spiritualism, if a certain religious persuasion or a, a certain philosophical uh, tradition is propagated, in a very pluralist country like India, the dangers to disunity are even greater. I'm not even talking of morality issue. I'm not even talking of rights issue. The dangers to disun of disunity are far greater, some people could argue. If you overemphasize a certain spiritual tradition, if the emphasis is on the humanist tradition that you have always been advocating, beyond a certain religion or beyond a certain philosophical tradition, then that will be perfectly all right. But unfortunately in this country, this mix of religion and politics has done us a great disservice. So how do you distinguish between religiosity in politics and spiritualism which is true and all-encompassing? Let us uh, first of all make a distinction between what is a religion and what is spiritual process. A religion arises because they have a set of beliefs. A belief arises because somebody says, this is it. Whether it is ten things written down or twenty-five things written down or three things written down, that's not the point, something written down. Somebody says, this is it, nobody listens. Then we say, God said it, everybody sits up. And still some people don't listen, those in the back benches don't listen. Then we tell, if you don't listen, God will come and burn you out. Then they also listen. So this has been the method of the religion. That is essentially you believe something. Let us understand the word belief. When you say, I believe something, what it means is, you don't know what it is, but you assume. That's what belief means. The English word belief literally means something that you do not know. You made a strong assumption about it, that becomes your belief. So essentially, it is ignorance institutionalized. Sadhguru, par pardon me for uh, a brief intervention, I entirely agree with you. But if that ignorance is not universal in the sense that my ignorance is different from the other person's ignorance, my God is different from his and therefore… Yes, yes, I'll, I'll come to that. No two human beings will believe the same thing, okay? You believe one thing, I believe one thing. Now, today we are both friends. Tomorrow, if you… I think this is it because my God said it. If you negate it, initially I'll tell you, please don't do it. If you don't listen, tell me whom should I protect, you or my God? I will naturally take the side of my God and uh, we wish to, uh, you know, put you in a different posting up in the heaven. <laughs> so the moment you believe, the moment you believe something that you do not know, you have started a conflict. The conflict might not have erupted, but it'll erupt someday. So that's… that is the reason why I'm saying one should understand the distinction between believing, knowing and seeking. Knowing obviously has not happened, so the only option that you have is to seek. So when you say, I am a religious person, you refer to yourself as a believer. That means, you have assumed something and concretized the assumption and you want to concretize that assumption in ten thousand people around you. When you say, I am a spirit… I am, I am on the path of spirituality, you will say, I am a seeker. When can you seek? Only when you have realized you, you do not know, you can seek. No seeking can be genuine. If you assume something and then seek, you do not know, that's why you seek. If you come here and you do not know, can you fight with somebody? You have no cause to fight with anybody. You have nothing to protect because you do not know. So spiritual process will remove conflict entirely, not in the society, essentially it removes it within you. Because social conflict is just a manifestation of the conflict that's happening in individual human minds. If I am fired up that you are transgressing on my beliefs, I will gather hundred people and then start something on you, okay? 
but it is what started in my mind which manifests in the society, not otherwise. So essentially the very root of conflict is taken away. Spiritual process also means this, that from the false identities that you have taken, coming to the reality of who you are. As we already went through this, if you are identified or if you realize you are just a piece of life and this life cannot happen here without being connected with the whole existence and if this becomes a living experience for you, only if it becomes a living experience for you, you must take the responsibility of other people's lives, not otherwise. So always in this country, in this culture, if somebody has to become a king, first thing is he must take a spiritual step because he needs inclusiveness. If he does not care, if he does not include these people as his, it doesn't matter what his intentions are, he… what he does will not be good to the people. So this inclusiveness if it has to come, spiritual process not only has to touch the population, first it must touch the leadership. We were doing a program for a group of very prominent people about eight years ago and uh, one person who's a, a very well-known and very important person in the administration stood up and asked, Sadhguru, that's fine, what about the country? I said, see, there are many things you can do, but the most important thing is some transformation is needed within the leadership because a leader means if you become a leader of the people, Every thought that you generate, every emotion that you generate, every action that you perform is going to impact millions of people. It's a tremendous responsibility and a privilege. When you have such a privilege, the first thing that you should do is enhance this, fix this in the way it needs to be fixed. Now you are going with the idea of you can fix it with morality. But I'm telling you, morals themselves, your moral and somebody else's moral will clash somewhere. As somebody's belief and somebody else's belief will clash, your ethics and somebody's ethics will clash somewhere. I'm saying this not to provoke you, but I would like you provoked. You are… when you have a set of ethics and you think this is it, you are also a kind of religion. I am the only religious person here because I have no values, I have no ethics, I have no beliefs. All I know is, if I look at people like this, I do not know which is me and which is not me. I see myself as everything and that's all I know. <laughs> this will not clash with anything. This is guaranteed, it will not conflict with anything. Essentially, Sadhguru, what you're saying is, there can only be an approach, not necessarily an answer and there's no one definite answer. Mm -hmm. I said there's one classic answer which will handle everything. Because if… if one set of beliefs, when they took it, it actually worked for them, do you understand? But as it grew, as the numbers gathered, then conflict erupted. Similarly, one set of morals or ethics, when you take it, initially as an individual, it will work wonderfully for you. As if you gather huge numbers behind you, people with these ethics will clash with people with some other kind of ethics or no ethics people. So you, you cannot really have another set of commandments, you have to think of yes. a, a uniform framework which everybody can understand and appreciate. Sadhguru, you have made a very passionate plea for spiritualism beyond religion. Something like a pantheistic approach to life rather than belief in a particular god and therefore… No, spiritual process has always been not a religious process. You need to understand this, this is the only godless country on the planet. This may be shocking, the people who believe and every day go to the temple, you need to understand this, we have thirty-three million gods and goddesses because we understood the technology of God-making. <laughs> we understood God is our making. So if you want, you can make the tree in your garden a god. If you want, you can make a rock into your god. If you want, you can make your mother into your god. If you want, you can make your cow into your god. Anything you want, you can make it into your god. So th we understood all we need is, if we look at life closely enough, there is no piece of creation without the hand of the creator in it. When I say this, suppose we take an atom, 
we know how proton, neutron, everything is doing, but we do not know what makes it happen like this. There is some force making all this happen. Now if you as much as eat a banana, this banana becomes a human being over a period of time within yourself, there is an intelligence which is making this happen. This intelligence, which we call as a source of creation, this source of creation is in every piece of creation. If you recognize it, well, an atom could be your god, an ant could be your god, an elephant could be your god, anything. Because we understood this, we went on creating. Now, people say India has too many gods. I feel they don't have enough gods. We had thirty-three million gods and goddesses when our population was so. <laughs> now you can make it one billion. Yes. Since then, because of external invasions and things, they made you feel ashamed of your gods, you stopped being creative. If you had 1.2 billion gods and goddesses, if every one of you had… actually you have this option, there is something called as Ishta Devata. If you don't like any of the gods that you have, you can create your own. I have my god, you have your god, will we ever fight? No. Only if my god has a following of hundred people, now we are going to fight. My god is only my god, we are not going to fight. So this is a simple understanding we came to long time ago. Because all you want is, you want an entity to relate with without any inhibitions. This is a human need, you can't take it away. People want an entity with which they can relate without any inhibition. Whoever may be around you, your family, your friends, still there are inhibitions. You can say something, you can't say something. You want somebody with whom you can be just yourself. This is a fantastic therapy for you and it works wonderfully well. There is no person on the planet whose life is as sweet as the, as the life of a devotee, not a believer, I am saying a devotee, because in devotion he finds he's so sweet, his life is beautiful for himself and he will never do anything beyond that, his sweetness will anyway spread. So the important thing that we need to understand here is, we are always thinking our… the way we are creating things in our mind, is more important than the creator's creation which is a completely wrong thing because this intelligence itself comes from creator's creation. Now, who is the creator? You think like this only because you are a person, this is your personality. Because you are human, you think one big human being is sitting up there and doing things for you. That is a childish version but if you created your own god, you know very well you created and still it works, wonderfully works for you. Now the important thing is to make a distinction, a clear distinction between belief systems which are labeled as religions of the world and seeking, wanting to know. Modern science has grown the way it's grown only because people were seekers, isn't it? If you turn outward and seek, you get labeled as a scientist. If you understand, if you want to know life, the best thing is to probe the life that you are, you will become a spiritual person. But both are seeking. So we call this spiritual sciences because you are seeking systematically. You are not assuming anything. This is needed. Because we fight because we've assumed, isn't it? It's our assumptions which are quarreling. The fight is never between good and bad though people would like to project like that. The fight is always between one man's belief versus another man's belief, religious or otherwise. Sadhguru, to go back to the practical realm of politics and governance, you have a real challenge in the country today, there's no point skirting over that. You go to any party leader, any legislator in the country, an MLA or MP or any chief minister or opposition leader, privately they all have the same lament. They say, look, I want to do something good, but without spending crores or rupees to buy the vote, I'm not able to get elected. Without putting up crooks and criminals as candidates in many places, my party does not have a chance of getting those seats. But once I get those people in, in this manner, I am helpless because then I am caught in a vicious cycle. I am caught in a vicious cycle, I cannot get out of it. Now, what do I do? I know this is a self-created problem. After all, the political process that ought to be the solution has become the problem over a period of time. 
partly because we centralized power, partly because we gave an illusion to people that a monarch is elected, a king is elected, not a representative to get things done through due process of law, partly because we have not really ensured even simple delivery of services, a birth certificate, a ration card, without some bakshis or sefarish, nothing happens. So we have a complex mess. You don't have money, you're not born, just understand. <laughs> <laughs> you're not born, absolutely. Uh, you know, one, one famous um, cricket star, when he was actually test cricketer, he told me of a story in, in Bangalore. There was a death in the family. He went to the municipal office for a death certificate. And he wanted immediately. They said, no, you can collect it tomorrow by paying 50 rupees. Then he asked the lady at the counter, look, I have to go on a West Indies tour tonight, uh, the test team. He was a very famous test cricketer. I will give you 100 rupees now. Can you give the certificate now? She said, yes. So one thing nice about corruption is it's totally socialist. Cricket star or influential person or a poor person, it applies universally. There, there is a huge problem. If you play 250 rupees, you can get it even if the person is not dead. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Add a few more zeros, you can actually kill the person. <laughs> but Sadhguru, given this context, unless some big changes are initiated, one, trusting our people to take care of their lives and their communities locally, empowering the community so that leadership emerges and they understand responsibility and limits, but with a danda. Some if things go wrong, you punish them very firmly, but people start taking responsibility. Now, you must define the word community. <laughs> it could There's be a, a village, on that. a village, a ward, whatever. Ah, that is not community. My religion is my community. My caste is my community. My family, my mama and his sons are my community. My village is not my community. My ward, what ward are you talking about? I don't know. My community is my blood. So, the definition of community has to change which is not easy work because we have not done that work, these things work best if it is done when the euphoria of nationhood happens. You are absolutely right Sadhguru, this is an extremely complex task, we messed up quite a bit. But now we have a challenge in our hands. We cannot give up in despair obviously and we cannot wait ad infinitum for a change because India does not have the luxury of another century or two centuries to transform the democracy. We have to make it happen as fast as is humanly possible. Yes. We 10, have been developing years. for too long. <laughs> exactly, we have been <laughs> developing too long. So given that, A, unless you create a situation in which the kind of people who sit here, who ought to be willing to take responsibility politically in any sane society, they are not willing to because they know it is a losing proposition. It is a thankless proposition, it's a losing proposition. But if you create conditions in which they can take responsibility and a good person, good in every sense of the term, not only morally but in terms of competence, in terms of delivery, in terms of vision, in terms of leadership, is now shunning public life. If you create a, a, an electoral model where you actually make it easy for such people to get elected, then things could change. I will give one illustration, uh, Sadhguru. We all talk about criminals in politics. Every state has some numbers, you know, murderers, this, that. In this state, actually in 1999, we came out with a list of 42 notorious criminals contesting elections at that time in the state. That actually was the beginning of a process which led to a law in 2003. But what's important is not description of these criminals. Why are these criminals in politics in the first place? We are skirting the questions. The first thing is, when there is no normative justice, I'm not talking of the higher justice, and I'm, I'm not careful with my words. <laughs> Even the justice in the court of law available to ordinary citizens, the criminal whom we revile has actually become the undeclared judge. He became the savior of the ordinary people. Therefore, he earned the respect and the money of the people. Two, once the criminal has that influence, he wants to be in politics because he can control the police in a system where the police are in the hands of politicians. Three, once in our electoral system, money power, caste power and muscle power together ensure a higher chance of success, the political parties are after you. And four, 
in a system where nothing gets done in an ordinary course, Danda seems to get at least some things done and therefore people are trusting a criminal to get at least something done in a wooden and inflexible system. So without going into these issues, merely saying criminals are there, let all politicians say criminals, doesn't really take us far. So my appeal to you is, could we evolve a framework? Could we make at least this class of people recognize what is the complexity of a political process and what are the things, what are the levers we could find to bring about the fastest and most genuine transformation of our polity? As you articulated the, you know, kind of defined the problem. I would uh, like to stretch it a little bit before I answer this question. That is, criminals are not entering politics because they want to control the police or this or that. Essentially, whether a policeman or a criminal means both of them carry the danda. That's why the danda goes on, both theirs. Now one serves what all of us have agreed as law. Another serves his own understanding of how the society should be. And whenever those who carry the danda to enforce the law do not wield it effectively enough, in reasonable amounts of time, then naturally people will look to somebody else who has the danda, who will wield it quickly. You get justice quickly. See, this whole thing about criminal is a big word. But today in India, it's become very ambiguous who is criminal, who is not. As it is, you know, so many people who are respected businessmen are in prison. Tihar jail is full of they're planning to build a, you know, Marriott hotel in uh, Tihar <laughs> because <laughs> so many business people, top-level people are there. It's time they did some modifications. And so many more are going to go if the judges go with the activism with which they are going, many, many more will go because Many of them to do their basic business every day have to deal with this kind of people, otherwise they cannot do their business. So the word criminal is a strong word and we need to understand this in the Indian context. As I said, our action should be appropriate to the situation we are in. We cannot talk like uh, Switzerland where if you put it on the notice board, this is the law, everybody will follow it. That's not where we are. We need to be, you know, <laughs> we need a lati to keep things going. We are still there, let's understand we are there. Whether we like it or not, that's where we are. So what is the solution? Solution is simple enough but not so easily enforceable. Now it's very easy to say, all of you ought by your… this thing, whoever the best man. Who is the best man? I don't like any of them. So what do I do? Lot of youth don't go and vote out, go out and vote, they think that's a solution. No, that's not a solution. Whom do I vote? Okay, the best criminal. Best means what? You don't know. So now we have come to a place, in Tamil there is a saying, Nallavan venama, vallavan venama. That means, do you want a good man or do you want a capable man? It's not, to, it's not possible to have both at the same time. I'm not saying it's not possible, but if that is the choice, what is your choice? If you're interested in the nation, you want a capable man. If you're interested in your own morality and ethics and values, you want a good man. Good people, who sit in important positions of power, very significant positions of power and who do not have the capability to make their goodness be manifest in their things, they will do more damage than a criminal. If a criminal heads this country, out and out criminal heads this country, probably India will become prosperous, he will rob the world. 
Right now he is robbing you, but if he becomes the prime minister, maybe he will rob the world. And many prime ministers, presidents and kings and emperors of the past have all been robbers and still are many of them. They are robbing effectively elsewhere and people are happy. <laughs>